got a message together for you. Um, I want to talk to you about the great potential that God has put inside each person here. I don't know if you're aware of this, but God created each one of us with limitless potential. He put inside of you great, great, great things. And um, life is really a journey to sort of mine out that potential that he's given us. But for many reasons, a lot of us never reach that potential or even get close to it. Uh, and a lot of us have to learn how to overcome the limitations put on us by other people and by ourselves. Um, I always like to see people live up to their potential. I think it'll be a, a sad thing when we go to the throne of God and God said, you used about 1% of what I gave you of 1,000%. You know, I mean, that's going to be a sad day. Uh, to me, I, I like to see people rise up and begin to believe in themselves, believe what God said about them, and overcome the limitations that the world puts on them. And there's somebody um, who, whose life I think could really encourage us, and that was King David. And I'm going to set the, set the story here for you to understand, but it's the, for those of you that don't know the story of King David, um, this particular part of the story is found in 1 Samuel 16, 6 through 7. And this is when the Lord came to the prophet Samuel and said that I'm going to send you to a, a home. The guy's name was Jesse, and you're going to anoint a new king because uh, he was going to replace Saul with a new king. So he sent Samuel, the prophet, to Jesse's home, and Jesse had several sons. And this is what the scripture says. Um, so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab, that was one of Jesse's sons, and said, surely... The Lord's anointed is before him. Uh, in other words, Samuel thought by looking at this guy, this guy looks kingly. This guy looks like he's the king. He's big. He's rugged. It must be him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his, at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the first thing is that David's own father, Jesse, didn't think that he had king potential. How many of us have grown up in families where our parents didn't see our potential? And that caused great, great damage. Because unfortunately, sometimes the people closest to you cannot see your potential. They're too familiar with you. Sometimes it takes a stranger to go, wow, you're really gifted at that. And your own family can't see what, what's, what you're made of. And so David had to overcome the fact that his father didn't think he had any kingly potential. David's brothers, which he had several, didn't think that he had warrior potential. In 1 Samuel 17, 28, it says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. He heard David when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Now David was coming down because he heard about the battle with Goliath, and he was actually coming down because he felt like the Lord was going to say, I'll battle this guy. But the brother, you know, and this happens to us in families too. We have brothers and we have sisters, and if, if we have great ones, we're lucky. But a lot of times we have jealousy in families, and we have people that uh, don't think you're made up of much, and they speak these things over you. So David had to overcome this, this brother who was totally against him because even his, all of his brothers didn't see his potential. King Saul didn't see his potential and didn't think he had champion potential in him. In 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 33, it says, Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. He's talking about Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. So even, even the king thought, no way, you're a little guy, you, you couldn't do this, this is impossible. Because everybody was looking at the outward appearance of David, and everybody was looking at the circumstances. And like God said, he said, I see into the heart, I don't see the outward thing. So God saw something completely different. Even Goliath didn't think that David was even a formidable opponent. So here's Goliath, this enormous giant, looking at this little kid saying, I'm going to take you down. Going, is this a joke? 
in, in 1 Samuel 17, 44 through, uh, 43 through 44, it says, So the Philistine, which is uh, Goliath, said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David uh, responded, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And so, you know, you can easily determine the caliber of a person by the amount of opposition it takes to discourage him or her. David faced great opposition. Everyone told him that he had no potential. But if you read the rest of the story, you realize that David slew the giant. And David killed the giant with a stone. And, and, and he, he dismayed everybody. And, and everybody was, they couldn't believe it. At, at all times, every single uh, authority in his life doubted him. So David had to, he had to learn how to overcome some things. And um, here are three things that David was able to do that we need to learn to do. He was able to go beyond the limitations put on him by his family. That's the first thing. Learning to go beyond the limitations put on you by your family. He was able to go beyond the limitations put on him by Saul, which was his leader, which was his king. We have to learn to go beyond the limitations of what uh, different people have put over us. And he was able to learn to go on be beyond the limitations of his enemy, which was Goliath. He was able to go beyond those limitations that Goliath put on him based on what Goliath thought was a low skill level. But he still was able to go beyond that. There's a lot of lessons from David's life, and that's what I'm going to share with you. First of all, limitations don't limit us unless we let them. Secondly, don't try to be someone else when others impose limitations on you. Third, when you rise above your limitations, you can help others to do the same. That's the whole reason for us to rise above our limitations. It gives everybody uh, a license to be who they're supposed to be. When, when we succeed at what we're supposed to be and overcome all the limitations, when you read successful stories about people like Albert Einstein or Helen Keller and they overcame all these things, what does that do for you? That gives you a license to go, well, they went through hard times. Everybody doubted them. Maybe I can do it too. When you rise up and be everything that God created you to be, you'll set others free in their life to be what they're supposed to be. That's the reason to do it. Um, and then our confidence must come from having confidence in who God made us to be and in what battles he has prepared for us to win. Now, five quick things for you to remember. Number one, God sees our potential when others don't. God sees our potential when others don't. Thank God for that. God sees what we're capable of when others only see our present day abilities. I started off by saying everybody here was, is born with genius potential. Everybody here has limitless potential. But God sees all of that when others just see nothing. And that's what we've got to count on, what he sees. God sees what is possible when others think it's impossible. God's power to work through us thank God, is not restricted by our current cir circumstances or by our perceived limitations. God is limitless. He can work through all of that. And lastly, God didn't make junk. He made priceless treasures. It is people who make us feel like junk. So we must always ask ourselves, who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe God? Or are we going to believe the people that speak ill of us, the people that don't see our potential? I have five things to share with you in this message about reaching God's potential for your life. Five things for reaching God's potential for your life. The first is to choose to honor God with a spirit of excellence. This is a choice. Whether we ever become excellent or live with excellence is completely up to us because God's give us, God has given us the potential to be excellent. But whether we want to or not is purely up to us. And there's a lot of labor involved and a lot of will involved in, in being excellent at anything. 
But again, the sad thing would be, would be to get to the end of your life knowing you were capable of excellence, but you, you gave a mediocre uh, output or effort towards life. See, to me, that's not, that's not appreciation for the potential that God gave you. So Proverbs 22, 29 says, Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. <coughs> Proverbs 18, 16 says, A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. And I like how James Roche put it. Success, real success, in any endeavor demands more from an individual than most people are willing to offer, not more than they are capable of offering. It's all about using, using the potential that you have. George Washington Carver, a great man, said, when you do the common things of life in an uncommon way, you will command the attention of the world. And even Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. The most important thing is to honor God with a spirit of excellence, to, to give your all to absolutely everything he puts in front of you, whether it's your job, whether it's your family, it doesn't matter. But to, to live with excellence is, is a choice. It's something that you form through decision to go, you know what? I'm living a mediocre life, or I'm only giving an average output. There's another quote I like. It says, the rarest thing a man ever does is the best he can. The rarest thing a man ever does is the best he can. How many of you know at the end of the day that you've given your absolute all that you have to give? Can you go to sleep knowing, I gave everything I had. I had nothing left to give today. I mean, that's how we should go to bed every day. That's how you choose to honor God with excellence is you give this very short life that we have, your absolute all to everything that you do at all times, knowing that one day it'll be over. Number two, be the unique person that God designed you to be. I like what Samuel Johnson wrote, and this is so true. Almost every man wastes a part of his life in attempts to display qualities he does not possess. If we just received and understood who God made us to be and the uniqueness of that and just said, I'm just going to be that. But we spend so much of our life comparing ourselves to others and going, oh, how can God make that person better looking than me or that person smarter than me or that person, so, so I should be more like that person or I should be more like that person instead of going, I'm this beautiful, unique creation that God made only one of. Let me just embrace who he made me to be. Let me embrace the originality that's me yeah, we have giftings that are similar to other people, and we can find c commonalities with us and other people, but we're still unique in the way that it all comes out. He still only gave you the exact DNA to do what you were put on the earth to do. If people would just understand that and stop wasting half their lives trying to be other people or trying to let people talk them out of being who they are, we would accomplish all these great things just to, just to learn to, to uh, let God love you the way he made you and then run with that. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. The world's always trying to make you something else. But God already said these things when he said, you know, you were fearfully and wonderfully made when I knitted you in your mother's womb. He, he already said that. I made you to be awesome. I made you to be unique. God didn't make any junk. The world makes us feel like we're junk. Who are we going to believe? And even Walt Disney said, the more you're like yourself, the less you are like anyone else. <laughs> the more you're like yourself, the less you are like anyone else. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't allow God to change um, bad things in your behavior or in your attitude. We all have challenges that, uh, <coughs> that we grew up with and circumstances that caused us to have maybe not the, the best attitude or the best outlook or the best work ethic or whatever we struggle with. Doesn't, doesn't mean that you just say, well, you know, I was born a jerk, so I, just, I guess I'm going to stay one. <laughs> it's not that, because then you never let the gospel transform you. The whole point of the gospel is not to sit here and come to church day after day, year after year, and, and, and be entertained by messages and singing. The whole point of the gospel is to let it somehow transform you to some of these qualities that weren't so great in your earlier days, 
become better in your latter days, that you have overcome things, that, you, that people could say, hey, he used to be like that five years ago. Now he's less like that. He's changed. If, if people can't see change in your life, evidence of, of the fruit of your life being changed, then I question whether you ever let the gospel get a hold of you because there's so many people that just hear the message and never, never let it sink deep into their heart and never make any changes. And that's just stubbornness, and that's just a refusal to let that Holy Spirit indwell and work in your life. So be the unique person that he created you to be, but be the best version of that. Be, be the most inspirational version of that, because he did put greatness in you. But because you're, you're, you're in heaven and not, I mean, because you're in earth and not in heaven where diamonds are everywhere, you know, you're, you're around a bunch of rocks and pebbles, <laughs> So you got to go, all right, let me, let me polish this rock. Let me get my old rock polishing kit out from when I was a kid. You know, and they used to sell those things in the Sears catalog, the rock polishing kit. I'm like, like, what was cool about that? I don't know. It's like, just pour water on it and it always looked like it was polished. Uh, but anyway, you know, God wants to polish us to make us the best version of what he created us to be. But that's all up to us, whether we let him, whether we let him or not. All right. The, uh, the third thing. Allow yourself to go through the process that God wants to take you through in order to be all he created you to be. King David, for example, he fought Goliath at a young age. But what you may not know, or those of you that didn't know the story well, well know this. But before he killed Goliath as a young shepherd boy, he learned to kill a lion and he learned to kill a bear. <laughs> in the wilderness time, God was training him. God was training him there. What do you think you would feel like if you were 12 years old and you managed to, to kill a lion or you managed to kill a bear? I don't know what it would make you feel like, but it would make me feel pretty confident. It would make me feel pretty strong, like, yeah. And, but, but David was never cocky. He was never arrogant. He was always like, the Lord helped me do this. He was always humble. He always understood where his strength came from. But that would put inside of me a great amount of confidence. You see, God wants to take each one of our lives through a process, through a training season. All of it is training for upcoming battles that he prepares for us to win. The sad thing is many of us don't win these battles because we're not letting him train us. We're not letting him prepare us. In those wilderness seasons of our life that we all hate, there's training going on if we let them. If not, there's just a bad attitude towards what's happening in our life, and then we just feel like jaded. We feel like God you know, isn't there for us. But he's always training us if we let him train us. And Psalm 144, 1 through 2 says, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. See, David allowed God to train him. David allowed himself to go through the process. All through his life, he allowed it. And even when he made a mistake, he allowed God to correct him. If we forsake the process, we'll never... We'll never uh, conquer the battles that God's placed for us to win. We'll never conquer them. We have to allow him to take us through the process, which is not comfortable, which is not fun. But, you know, how many of you know when you went to school, it wasn't always fun? Right? You know, taking an exam, taking a test, going to college, preparing for a final. None of this stuff is really fun. <laughs> but it was all necessary to train you for a position that later you're doing in life. You know, the things we're doing now in our life, whatever it is, you know, are, are things that we learn at some other point in our life that, that cause us to be qualified to do whatever we're currently doing. And if we're not doing very much, it's because we didn't allow ourselves to get trained earlier to be more qualified for something bigger that God has for us. We have to allow ourselves to go through the process to be qualified for the things that God's trying to graduate you up to. And that's just all will. And the Lord will direct us as he did David. Psalm 37 through 23 says... The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. What is the good man? The good man is the one who just keeps listening to the voice of God and keeps following him. It's very simple. A good man is the man who puts his trust in the Lord and believes in God to overcome the circumstances that he can't overcome. Believes in God to give him the abilities that he needs to rise up to the occasion. A good man is just somebody who trusts the Lord. And part of trusting him is letting him take you, through the, take you through the training. Charles Schwab, a great famous businessman, said, When a man has put a limit on what he will do, he has put a limit 
on what he can do. There again, some of these limitations that we have in our life are put on us by ourselves because we limit what we'll do. We'll go, well, I'm only going to I'm only going to give this much of an effort, or I'm only going to work that hard, or I'm only going to forgive if they do this, but I won't forgive if they do that. I'm only going to, you know, punch in the time clock and do the least amount of effort while I'm at my job to get out of this place. You know what I mean? I'm only going to give the least amount of effort. Well, whatever limits you put on yourself, is, 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 that's your ceiling. That's, that's how high you're going to go. But the, again, God made us with this limitless potential. Why wouldn't we want to, like, honor God by reaching some of that potential. Man, at least half of it. It's kind of like he gave everybody a, a million dollars, but you've got to withdraw from the bank account to use it. He gave you a million dollars, but hey, if you sit there on the couch all the time complaining about what you don't have and you never make it down to the bank <laughs> to make a withdrawal, whose fault is that? He left you the inheritance. You've got to go show the, the will and the testament and say, hey, I was left with a million dollars in the bank. I was given all this potential. I was given all these battles that God pre-assigned for me to win, but all I did was lay on the couch and whine and complain. I just de decided not to fight any of them. So you're not going to win any of them. To me, I like to see people rise up and, and rise to the occasion and go, you know what, I can do this. I can do this not because of me, because of the potential that God put in me, and because I, I could learn to hear his voice. Number four, think like God thinks. Believe what he believes about you. If we really thought like God thought and really believed what he said, man, we'd, we'd accomplish everything. Jeremiah 29, 11, we've heard it a thousand times, but do we believe it? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. How many times have we heard that? But do you really believe it? Do you believe that he has plans to prosper you and not to harm you? Because when you say, God's done this to me, God's done that to me, God's, you know, then that, you're not believing that he's got plans to prosper you. You're just believing God's out to get you, right? We've got to start believing what God believes about us and thinking the way he thinks. David Schwartz said, Where success is concerned, people are not measured in inches or pounds or college degrees or family background. They are measured by the size of their thinking. This is what God says. Think the things that he thinks. Franklin Roosevelt said, The only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. We have to learn to think the way God thinks. We have to learn to believe what God believes about us. We have to stop looking at what the world says about us or even our own doubt about ourselves. We have to go, this is... God, this is who God made me to be. I'm made, I'm made in the image of God. Man was made in the image of God. We're like him in some kind of way. We're like him in this creative way, this way that we can just create. All, all of us in this room just know how to create. You give us anything, and we just know how to create with it. We're creative people. We're like our Father. He's creative. God made us to be like him. We're, we're spirit. He's spirit. We communicate to him in our spirit. We believe him in our spirit. In our spirit is where we choose to go, I'm, I'm going you know, to believe what God said I can do, not what people said I can't do. And that's, that's, the place, that's the place where we win the battle. Number five, put your confidence in the Lord and in his ability to lead, train, and work through you and not in the opinion of others. That's the key to all of it, is just putting your confidence in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. This is just about all the times we don't understand what's going on, what's happening, what's falling apart. I don't know, Lord, but I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to acknowledge you. This morning I was writing down in my journal all the miracles God's done in my life in, in 2012. Man, that encourages me when I see all the different things. And, you know, what you might qualify as a miracle and what I might qualify as a miracle are two different things. But every day that we're above ground, it's a miracle. There's a lot of opportunities to take you out every single day. And if you're alive, that's a, another daily miracle. 
You know, another opportunity to repent, another opportunity to make amends, another opportunity to work harder. So I wrote down all these things, and I began doing it on the plane on the way here. And some of them are really big things, and some of them are things that were only big to me. Some of them revolved around my family. Some of them revolved around my purpose. Some of them revolved around finances. They revolved around all kinds of things. But I find when I do that that it lets me know that I can keep putting my trust in the Lord. Because every time that he has bailed me through a different situation that I thought I couldn't overcome, it's just more proof that trusting him is the way to go. And God wants you to acknowledge, like it says, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. What does that mean, in all your ways? Like, Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for this person. Thank you for that friend. Thank you that this person forgave me. Just acknowledging him and giving God credit for everything in your life, and he shall direct your paths. Trusting God is the, the best thing that you can do in your life ever. Jeremiah 33 uh, 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Call to the Lord. He's going to show us things. He's going to teach us how to do things we don't know how to do. He's going to show us things we don't know. He's going to give us wisdom we can't attain any other way. Call on me, he says. Zechariah 4 6 not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It's by God's spirit that all this stuff is done. But we have to put our trust in him. Deuteronomy 33.12 says, Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long, and the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. That's a very comforting scripture for me. When I read that, it makes me feel like God as a, as, a, as a father, like a real father. You know what I mean? That you could just go, man, I'm having a hard, a hard day, Dad. And he just puts you in his arms and makes you feel like everything's going to be all right. And sometimes, you know, God gives us creative visualizations. Sometimes when I'm tempted to worry or tempted to doubt, and I'm laying in bed, I'll just kind of picture myself like, Lord, this is too big. This is too heavy for me. I'm just going to lay up in your lap. I'm just going to lay up in your arms, and I'm just going to let you hold me. And I envision God holding me in that way, and then I'm able to go to sleep without worrying about the things that could consume a man. And I just picture him, you know, uh, he's given us the ability to envision things. So I just envision him as the scriptures say, as this loving father, and then I believe him. I'm going to close out. Um, we talked about David. I encourage you to, like, study those scriptures and Samuel and study his life and just go, you know, God sees all of our hearts, too not just David. He's given us the potential to do great things and, and to, to have great exploits against his enemies. He's given us these battles to win if we would just get up and fight. Now, how would da If David were alive to pray today for us through his life, what would he share? What would he, what would he tell you to encourage you? So I wrote down this little prayer, and then I'll close with prayer. And then if anybody else needs prayer after the message is over, I'm, I'm happy to pray for people. But this is what I think David would say. Dear Lord, help my brothers and sisters to see themselves as you see them, not as others do, to focus on what can be accomplished with you and to rise above the limitations placed on them by others or even themselves. Help them to be all you created them to be so that they might help others rise above their limitations and set them free. Father, I thank you for uh, this day. I thank you for uh, the message you put on my heart. I pray that each person here would uh, open their heart and open their spirit to hearing from you, not from me, but from how you speak through your word, and how you speak through your promises. And I pray where people have not given their all to life, that you would compel them to give their all while they're still here, while there's still yet time. I pray that you would challenge people that have been apathetic or lazy or complacent in, in uh, following and pursuing you. I pray, for, I pray for those who have given all of their heart that you would give uh, encouragement and confidence and patience and peace to you. And I pray for you to give everybody here a true vision of, of how you see them and what you really say. And I rebuke and come against all of the negative images of self that people have had thrown on them from the beginning of birth to now and all the different things they've had to overcome. I pray for just a, a decree, a release in the spirit 
to be the unique person you created them to be and to see themselves as you see them, full of life, full of love, full of potential, full of gifts, full of talent, full of skills, and full of purpose. I pray against all the word curses spoken over everybody in this room. We've all had them spoken over us by enemies, by friends, by parents, by loved ones. Uh, people have said wrong things about all of us. I refute all of that in the name of Jesus, and I plead the blood of Jesus over every ill word spoken and even words we've spoken over other people. I pray that we would all repent from the words we've spoken uh, over other people limiting their potential and not seeing them as you see them. And I just pray for a cleansing of our spirit, Lord, that we could just clean the slate and start anew, that we could begin today going, for the rest of my life, I'm going to honor God with excellence. For the rest of my life, I'm going to pursue him with confidence. For the rest of my life, I'm going to trust him for the things I don't understand. And for the rest of my life, I'm going to make up for all the stuff I didn't do right in the first part of my life. Just pray for a cleansing, for just a fresh start, for an anointing to start over, Lord. We need to start over today. And I pray for a great release of encouragement and inspiration that it's not too late to be all you created us to be. So, Lord, I just speak all these things, and I decree them, and I thank you for the opportunity to come here and share, and uh, I look forward to great results and great praise reports of the things you've done in every individual's life in this room as time goes. So we thank you for all that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. And if anybody would like any uh, prayer, I'm going to bring Will up here, and I'm going to be down here. Uh, thank you guys for listening. I hope that uh, the message somehow inspires and encourages you, and I'll be happy to, uh, if anybody needs prayer, to pray down here. Thank you.